amigos, ¿cómo están? Yo soy Javier Moto y esto es Auto 060, la edición especial del Auto Show Nueva York 2013. Estuvimos ahí la semana pasada, perdón, esta semana, estoy, ya estoy confundido con los días, porque los días, los meses y los años, porque estuvimos ahí en Nueva York, como les digo, el Auto Show 2013, viendo autos del 2014 e incluso a, a algunos del 2015, lo que es realmente increíble ya. Así que vamos a tener todo el show dedicado a las novedades que vimos allá en Nueva York, entrevistas muy interesantes con eh, ejecutivos, eh, diseñadores, eh, con eh, colegas periodistas, sobre todo del auto, del premio al auto mundial del año. Así que este es el show del Auto Show Nueva York 2013. Vamos a empezar en este primer segmento con el... Eh, eh, James Farley, que es el presidente de la Lincoln, o una, cosas muy interesantes que tiene esa marca. Vamos a continuar, como les decía, con los premios al Auto Mundial del Año. Un par de entrevistas con los ganadores. La gran sorpresa que tuvo General Motors ahí con el Camaro Z28. También novedades de la Mini. Eh, no presentó ningún modelo nuevo, pero sí varios programas interesantes y... Eh, BMW y Mini, que son parte de la misma compañía, presentaron también una serie de aplicaciones para el teléfono muy, muy interesante. Y finalmente, un par de entrevistas más sobre tecnología de seguridad y los autos Spiker, los autos super deportivos que no tuvieron auto físicamente en el auto show, pero tuvieron grandes noticias. Así que vamos aquí con la noticia con James Farley. Jim, thank you very much for having us here in the New York Auto Show. Uh, Lincoln is coming up with a, a very interesting and new thing. But also you, uh, in your presentation this morning to open the show, you have very important facts and numbers about Google, Facebook. How does that have to go with cars? Well, I, I think, frankly, um, the mobile life we all live now is a fundamental shift for our industry because the amount of time people are spending and what's interesting about about um, Facebook and Google and, and the engagement of the customer is the same thing that's going to impact our our world, not just advertising, yeah. more importantly, the expectation of the car. Um, I see a day very soon uh, that not only can you get Pandora and Spotify in your car, but your car is aware of where you are, tells your friends on Facebook where you are, the car is giving you input on your fuel economy, uh, maybe entering contests on how well you're doing in your fuel economy, your wiper blades are telling everyone what's going on with the weather, so, you know, so the people behind you know how the weather's changing, all that's going to be happening. Today, the car is almost isolated, the mobile phone is connected, Uh, we're quite unique because we have an open architecture. You can use Facebook and Google on your car, but it's really not, it's connected physically, but it's just, the car's not talking to the rest of your life. full integration to like the, the person, the people. Exactly. So now it's time, and that's what we want to bring today, is to bring Facebook and Google to e educate the industry on the important changes that are coming. And it's amazing, like, if you think about what cars have today, and if you think back, Only like five, seven years ago, let's just say 2005, eight years ago. I mean, this is like a huge advancement. And so when you think about what would happen in the next three to five years, even more fascinating. I agree with you, and I think the shift that we're going to see is a different shift than we've seen the last couple of years. What we've seen the last couple of years is all the features in the cars have gotten much more sophisticated. Blind spot monitoring, rear camera, all the onboard technology has certainly been an advancement. And we've seen now the ability to pretty much connect anything you bring in the vehicle with the vehicle. The next five years is going to be quite different. What you're going to be seeing then is because of that connectivity, now the data is going to be shared. Yeah. And that's going to change the experience. What I mean by that is you have all the displays, the car's talking to your social graph, you, the car knows where it is, and the data is being shared, not just the devices are connected. As they're being shared, the integration is going to change, and now it's going to be fun to drive. Yeah. And you're going to be connected to your friends. You'll know where they are, how long it'll take for them to get to where you are. All the stuff that we used on a mobile phone when we walk, is going to be available on your car. And uh, speaking of things that change and things that don't change, MPG is still a big worry for everybody. More than pricing, I, I, I understand. Yes. And uh, Lincoln has a pretty cool initiative to connect it to the phone also. Right? So can you talk about that? Do you have a concept for a new app? Yes, uh, we launched today for Ford and Lincoln. Uh, a contest for $50,000 for the first app developer to come up with the coolest app that uses our open architecture for the car so the data from the car and the customer's fuel consumption will be shared with this um, 
app developers, and they'll write apps that live on your phone, and the coolest app that helps a person um, get the best fuel economy, have the most fun in the car, is going to win the fifty thousand dollars. Why is that important? Because what we find is that the EP label really doesn't tell you what actually happens in the those, real world. Those tests are done under perfect circumstances, I guess. And, and the EPA test great. was never uh, imagined to be used in that kind of way. But people take them right now. Yes, because we in the industry have allowed it to be an advertising tool. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's now just confusing customers. And frankly, EP never imagined it would be used that way. The reality is that the way you drive the car, and the geography of where you are is much more input on your actual real-world fuel economy than the car. And so what we're doing with this app is giving people the ability to actually learn how their own driving behaviors affect the car. So because the, the, the driver is the most important factor into that, how, how much gas can you get out of the car? Yes, I remember uh, I drove a C-Max last weekend. I drove it um, I drove it to my sister's house, it was about 50 miles, and on the way there, I drove it according to how the car advised me to with the lease and the car and the Ford system. I got 48 miles per gallon. On the way back, I drove it like I drive it, like I drive my Mustang, and I got 30-something. And, um, but but hybrids especially are very sensitive. Yeah, I mean, more, 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 more different, more, more, less constant than like the gas engines, right? That's right, and as a result, I, I did that to myself to see the variability, yeah. and it's amazing. Even braking, people don't know that braking in your engine could mean five miles per gallon or not. So when you get your first, your car, and you look at the gas mileage, it's going to get much better over the next couple thousand miles. So the ultimate goal of this uh, contest for the application is what you we were talking at the very beginning, like sharing information with other drivers, with everybody, basically, through your phone, through your app, and like, at the end, say gas. Exactly. So you can use it for your vacation. Excellent. That's, that's really cool. So I'm going back to the product part of Lincoln. Lincoln is like in a rebirth process, yes. right? Uh, so, um, and you were also talking about how you think that it's trying to connect more with an Hispanic community in the U.S., which is like one of the fastest growing segments of the population. The uh, fastest growing. <laughs> people don't think too much about it, but like if you take the census numbers that you mentioned in the thing, it took about 50 million people. It's like more than Canada. Right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing people. I, I, I was so impressed with the census data as, uh, as some an executive in a car company. One of the things I noticed, for example, in a state like California, the people that are just buying their first car from 25 to 34, that age group, yeah. 60, more than 60% have Hispanic surnames in California. And they are driving the market. And most importantly, what we mentioned is this growth of 100,000 plus Hispanic households. The Hispanic community is becoming so affluent. And we as an industry have not really paid attention to that as much as we should. As a challenger brand, we're coming out with the new MKC, our new affordable small crossover. Yeah. We think that would match perfectly with the Hispanic community. So we are now, as we finish the product's development and look to market it, we are really looking carefully at that affluent Hispanic com community to see if Lincoln could be a brand that resonates with them. Very good. Well, thank you very, very much for all the fascinating information, honestly, and your time here in uh, your outer show, and you know, you're really busy here with all, all the things that are going on here. So thank you very much again, Jim. Thank you, my treat. Love to spend time with you. Thank you. Well, very interesting all what James Farley sobre la Lincoln, el mercado hispano en Estados Unidos con los autos de lujo y hablando de autos de lujo, los mejores autos que se vieron en el Auto Show de Nueva York, vamos a hablar con nuestro colega John McCormick, eh, uno de los presidentes, uno de los representantes del comité de, de jurados del premio al auto mundial del año que se entregó allá en el Auto Show de Nueva York y por segundo año consecutivo la Volkswagen se llevó el premio principal. Aquí vamos con John McCorney. Here with John McCorney, we talked last week about the candidates and now we have the winners. And Volkswagen a uh, repeat, huh? Because they won with the up last year and now the Golf. Yeah, um, uh, kind of expected, I guess, because the Golf is such a world car. Yeah. Literally, it's sold all over the world and it's a car that's successful to so many people. And that's what the, the, the words stand for, basically, right? I mean, the cars have great technology, great design, but really, is that what's more appealing for more people around the world? That's the idea. I mean, it, it's, uh, it'd be unlikely that a Ferrari would win World yeah. Car of the Year. Why, for some people, it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, although in China, they're selling a lot of them, so who knows? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then on the other category is the Boxster, uh, came out in a combination, which I, I thought when I saw the list of candidates was one of the best cars doing. 
Yes, uh, and a barge stir came in. It is, you know, an accessible porch, I guess you could say. So it that makes sense. For yeah. Them, yeah. And as as we mentioned last week, as some people even think it's better than 911, more affordable. It's, <laughs> it's certainly getting there. Yeah. It's so yeah. much paying the place 911 used to. Yeah, it has a central engine, so it's more balanced car and all that. So I, I mean, great thing for them too. And then the um, green car of the year, the Tesla, I also expected a little bit, right? Yeah, the Tesla seems to be uh, sort of on a, on a roll. It's a hot car in many people's eyes, and it's won some other awards. Uh, so, it, you know, it is a standout. Uh, however, I think the Volvo is very worthy, too, and, and I would have voted for that. Yeah, I mean, and that technology is, like, so advanced, and, like, so many great things coming out of there. It's got the kind of hard, but I guess the Tesla had more technology, not only the powertrain, but also the design, the interior of the car and everything, right? Yeah, yeah, it scores on a lot of levels, so yeah, it's exactly. impressive. Thing. And then finally, the design car, the Jaguar, with like a nostalgic car for many people, like coming back after many years, uh, the F-Type. Uh, a good award, I think, too. I agree yeah. with that one, too. Yeah, and Jaguar, you know, it's got such a rich, rich design yeah. history, so um, for them to win with this car is a good indicator of where they're going. It's great. Yeah, it was a great event. Well, so the process starts again. You are, I guess you're already evaluating cars for next year, right? Yes, we have to start looking at the cars that are on the, on the shelf and on the showroom floors and decide what's going on. Well, the cyber again. Maybe we'll talk again next year. Thank Appreciate you, Jack. It. Thank you. Y ahí estaba John McCormick eh, presentando las novedades, el anuncio sobre el premio al auto mundial del año, el auto de performance, el auto deportivo del año, el auto al mejor, el premio al auto con mejor diseño del año y el auto verde. Eh, realmente no muchas novedades realmente porque el eh, Volkswagen Golf, Volkswagen viene haciendo autos realmente increíbles desde hace ya mucho tiempo y con eso están eh, cumpliendo su objetivo de convertirse en el fabricante número uno del mundo para el año 2020. Eh, y no se vayan porque cuando regresemos en el siguiente segmento vamos a hablar con dos de los ganadores o los representantes de dos de los ganadores con Mark Giles de la Volkswagen que nos va a hablar de la séptima generación del Golf y vamos a hablar también con Nick Stewart de la Porsche hablando también del segundo premio consecutivo que se lleva la Porsche en estos uh, premios al auto mundial del año asimismo con el ingeniero Darren Bowen de la General Motors que nos presentó el nuevo Camaro Z28 y esta fue quizá la única gran sorpresa, la única sorpresa que vimos en el Auto Show de Nueva York porque todo lo demás, además de los premios, del anuncio de los premios, todo lo demás prácticamente ya se conocía en esta era moderna del Internet. Así que no se vayan que cuando regresemos las entrevistas con los ganadores a los premios del Auto Mundial del año 2013 en el Auto Show de Nueva York. 